All right, welcome everyone. We're going to wait for a few minutes so everyone can get joined with us. But you are in the right place and I see people joining already. So thank you for being here. The nice somewhat muggy shady morning here in Springfield. So not a bad day to be sitting in on a webinar. For just a few more. I'm seeing some SCG staff members. Hello, everyone. I know a lot of our staff are meeting together for a watching party in a coffee shop, which I'm a little bit jealous of. But thank you for being here. That sounds fun. And I think for the sake of time, we can go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks again for being here this morning. My name is Anna Withers, and I am the Farmer and Resource Development Manager for Springfield Community Gardens. If you don't know us, we are a nonprofit based in Springfield, Missouri, whose vision is a community where everyone has access to healthy local food. So we run a variety of educational workshops to help growers um, and prepare them for growing in the Ozarks. We run 16 community gardens, three urban farms, a commercial kitchen, and a community food forest. In this particular workshop on gardening safely in soils with lead and heavy metals is generously funded by the 2501 program from the USDA Office of Partnerships and Public Engagement. Tonight we are, or today, we are joined by the president and owner of Sea Tour Solutions, Dr. Sabine Martin. Sabine, would you like to tell us just briefly a, a little bit about yourself? And you're on, you're, you're still on mute. All right, okay. how's that? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Anna. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, obviously I, I deal in, in brownfields. My, my small company is, is geared towards help communities dealing with blighted, underutilized properties and bringing them back to the beneficial use, a lot of these, these uh, properties can be used for, for gardens, you know, for food protection in, in, in communities. And my other hat, so to speak, is I'm adjunct faculty in the Department of Agronomy here at Kansas State University. I'm also a master gardener. So the nexus there from, from growing something, gardening and doing that on brownfield sites to the benefit of a community. I mean, that's, that's where I, I like to be. <laughs> Is that good enough? That's that's wonderful. That's awesome. wonderful. <laughs> and your your background in the garden is very on brand for all of that. So thank oh, good. you. <laughs> and we're also joined by Laura Miller from the Springfield Green County Health Department. And Laura, why don't you tell us a little bit more about your position there? Hi, um, my name is Laura Miller. I am a public health nurse from <laughs> Springfield Green County Health Department, and I am the lead case manager for Green County. So. Um, I work with families all in our county um, with children under the age of six that have elevated lead levels. And um, I th think that's just something a lot of people think has been old and it's gone and it's not really a concern, but it definitely is still um, a concern, especially in Missouri. Um, and so I'll touch more on kind of the health aspects of that. But I, I work with the kiddos and the families and trying to get rid of their source of lead exposure. And um, that's what I do. Well, we really appreciate both of you being here. So thank you again so, so much. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. For our attendees, if you have questions, please uh, go ahead and feel free to add them to the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. And we'll probably hold onto most of them for some Q&A time at the end, but if there's something very pressing or relevant to what 
we're talking about, we can go ahead and um, ask the presenters at that time. But if you're able, please try to use the chat features for comment only for comments only, and then the Q and A specifically for questions, because that'll help me make sure that we answer everything that we need to. And if you need to refer to this workshop later, it's going to be added to Springfield Community Gardens YouTube channel. We have an agricultural workshop playlist. Um, so you can always refer back to it there. And I'm going to be putting a bunch of resources into the chat, including our website um, and social media and tonight's exit survey. Uh, and I also wanted to mention that this webinar is actually going to be part one of a two-part series on how to garden safely in soils with lead and heavy metal contamination. So please stay tuned on news for that follow-up webinar. But we, you know, we know that the first step toward finding solutions and implementing them is understanding the problem. So we really hope to paint a good picture of the risks involved and the prevalence of lead in the soil in our area. So we're gonna get started uh, with Laura. So Laura, if you wanna go ahead and share your screen. And once sure. again, thank you everyone for, for being here and we can go ahead and get started. Okay. Looks can good. Can you see everything? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so just a, another little overview of, of kind of the process with how we do our lead case management within our county. It's a statewide um, program. Certain counties in Missouri are higher risk. We, uh, Missouri is the number one lead producing um, state in the country. And so um, just from having mines and stuff throughout the state, we, Green County is not one of the high risk counties. Um, but that, I always thought that's really interesting when I, I'm still newer to this world, but when I first started doing this position, I was really surprised by that. So that's just something really interesting about Missouri. Um, and we'll go ahead and get started. Hmm. There we go. Um, so we're just going to talk about um, preventing lead poisoning in kiddos because that is that's my wheelhouse is working with the young children um, and just kind of the basics, the overview of lead poisoning. Um, it does not naturally occur in our bodies. It is, um, it enters the body through inhalation, ingestion, um, touching it, absorbing it through the skin, which that takes a lot for that to happen, um, or um, endogenous, which is where it is stored in the bones or teeth. So one of the big, big points with this, if um, a woman was um, as a child had lead poisoning, had really you know elevated lead levels, that is stored in the bones. And then if down the road, she was pregnant and had a baby during pregnancy, um, just how our bodies process, some of that can be leached through the bones to the baby. So that's kind of those long-term things we don't really think um, down the road, but that is something that can happen. So um, just things to make note of. Also, most of the times uh, there is no notable symptoms. You're not gonna, like with someone that has the flu, they're not gonna be vomiting and headaches and all those things. They really, the biggest thing is that they have to be tested to know um, that they have elevated levels. If they get extremely high, then that's where they're gonna end up with um, the immediate effects. And that's a lot of times seizures, um, coma can lead to death. And that's, those are extremely high levels. Um, so that's the big thing. Um, it is toxic to the human body. It can impact all the systems, body systems. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, the health effects are irreversible. And so that's why we really want to talk about prevention because um, once their levels are elevated, you can bring them down to a um, an acceptable level. But if they have, um, they can have lasting effects of that. So um, it's an environmental hazard and it is preventable like we talked about. 
Um, kind of, I like this infographic. Some of the big things specific to children's health is that it damages um, their brain and their nervous system, slows down growth and development, um, learning and behavior problems, hearing and speech problems. So sometimes if we've got a little one that has had blood poisoning um, and they're a toddler, um, which in the state of Missouri, if a child is on Medicaid, they are required to be, it is, um, it is required, it doesn't always happen, but if they are on Medicaid, they need to be tested at 12 and 24 months. That's just part of the um, requirements for that. Be just because that's the big hand to mouth activity. Those are the ages that they're putting everything in their mouth. Um, and so those are the ages that they wanna be screened um, and tested for sure. Um, but down the road, if, you know, when they were a toddler, if they had elevated levels, once they get into school, those are sometimes when those effects um, are seen. So lower IQ, decreased ability to pay attention, underperformance in school. Um, just an example, the nurse that did this prior to me, she um, was discussing a case. There was twins um, and they had elevated levels when they were probably two. Um, and then when they got to kindergarten, when they did all their kindergarten screenings, the one that had the higher lead levels were, was having difficulty on the screening test and they ended up um, needing some help in school. So it's um, not an immediate threat right at that time, but you can see the lasting effects that it can have. Um, it does not take much at all to elevate a child's lead level. Um, this is a good analogy. Um, this kind of this came from the state, and I really like this analogy to to pass this on to share. So envision just a sugar packet in a football stadium. Like that's relative of the amount that it's going to take to really elevate um, a child's level. And it's really it's the dust um, that they're exposed to most of the time on kiddos. Um, because they're down on the ground where things have been brought in from. So we're talking about gardening. They've been outside, they're in the dirt, things get tracked in the house. They're the ones that are down on the ground playing, crawling around, their toys are on the floor. And just that dust that you or I don't ever see gets on something and then it gets there. Most of the time they're putting their hands in their mouth. So that's kind of where their exposure is coming from most of the time. Um, during COVID, the CDC changed the recommendations of the levels um, down to 3.5 micrograms per deciliter, which previously used to be five. Before that, it used to be 10. And they're really saying no lead level is safe um, in a child, but it we've tried to do a lot of education with that because that just wasn't on the top of everyone's list during COVID. And that information didn't always get disseminated to all the um, to the pediatricians and providers. So we're trying to educate. So this is actually what the recommendations are now. Um, and so if a child does come back with those levels that are above that, then we wanna do follow-up testing. And we wanna, we can come in the home, we can talk to the family and find out, you know, talk about what their home is like, what, where the child's exposure is coming from. Um, it's not a thing of the past. I think that's, that's a big thing um, just to, to educate everyone on is that we do still have, um, lead in our area. And a lot of times it's coming from the older homes that paint. That was, um, I believe 1978 was when it was, um, the laws changed to eliminate lead in paint. And so, this specific to Springfield, we have a lot of older homes in this area still. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's where um, the majority of it comes from, the exposures are coming from. And so I know you guys are going to talk more on um, older homes in those areas and everything where you're gardening, but um, we do have a lot of older, older homes still in our area. Um, so cleaning, that's a, that's a big way to prevent exposure to the kiddos. Um, window sills is a big, um, a big area that we see for kiddos that are exposed, especially from those older homes. The paint is chipping. Um, it kind of looks like alligator skin. That's a good way to describe it. Um, 
So if you're in an older home and a lot of times around those windowsills is where that paint is going to be chipping, kiddos are playing under the window, they're standing up, pulling it up, looking out the window, all in that area, that dust um, is what they're getting uh, exposed to. So good cleaning, make sure you're cleaning out the old wood window sills with um, wet paper towels or a wipe, um, not dry dusting. That's the big thing because they're just stirring it up in the air and, and everyone's getting more exposed that way. Um, wet paper towel is probably the best so you can just pitch it when you're done. Um, and if you have an old window and that paint is chipping and you're going up and down, up and down that friction and that dust being um, let out, that's that's the big thing on those. Um, even if they don't look dirty, just a good wipe down of them is, is a good preventative cleaning tip. Um, on hard floors, not just dry sweeping, um, that's just redistributing that dust. So like the Swiffer, um, mops those are great because you can just pitch pitch those or if you have like a reusable one that you can wash those are really good um sometimes a traditional mop and bucket because you're just dipping it back in that same water and then re-mopping it back over the whole floor so that's um that's a big thing on cleaning the floors also um if you are in an older home and there's carpet in the home a vacuum with a hepa um, filter. Those can be pricey, but those are the ones that are going to um, hang on and get that lead dust um, eliminated out of the carpet better. Hey, Laura, may uh -huh. I interrupt you for a moment? Um, sure. A good question we received is, can you see the lead dust? You said no. something about it's harder to see, so it's invisible. Um, I wouldn't say it's invisible, but it's so fine that it's, um, you're not going to look at dust on a table and tell, oh, that's lead versus just regular dust that you're cleaning. Yeah, okay. it's super fine. Um, so no, you can't really just. Okay. So and that's why the good clean. And then besides a HIPAA filter noted, but are there any particular cleaning products that are better than other, like for wiping the sills? And what Not that I know of, but the biggest thing is that it's wet cleaning. Um, just not not a dry dust like don't just take a dust rag and just dust it off like the biggest thing is that it's the wet so it's hanging on to all that dust and eliminating it mm -hmm. okay thank you you're welcome um kind of back to the carpeted flooring the hepa vacuums um is still what's recommended by um state epa all of the agencies that work with lead um, and also vacuuming slowly. I know myself when I get in a hurry, when I clean, but you're trying to get through everything as fast as you can. Um, but if you know that you have your child's been exposed to lead and you're trying to clean in the house well, um, just a good slow vacuum and then you can go over it um, in different directions. That's the big thing. That's just a good slow cleaning. Um, washing hands is this is the biggest one really, um, especially in those ages where everything they're putting in their mouth, um, washing their hands really good before eating is huge. You know, we want kids outside and playing and playing in the dirt and all of the things, um, but just make sure they're, you're helping them scrub, scrub their hands really good before eating. Um, this is really important too, if um, a kiddo is getting their lead levels tested because a lot of times physicians will want to just do a little finger stick first um, just because it's it's easier on the child. We we know that. Um, but if they don't wash their hands really good before and if for some reason they between home and into the doctor's office, they were touching something and they had something on their fingertips, sometimes the test can be a little skewed and not quite as accurate. So. Um, that's a big thing on that. Cleaning their toys, um, wiping, just like you're, you don't want to dry dust. You want to clean their toys off really well with um, just a paper towel or wipes or anything um, just to get that dust off. Um, talking about lead testing. So we touched base on um, in Missouri, Medicaid requires the testing at 12 and 24 months. Um, also, if you do live in an older home um, or just if child if a child's at their well visit, there's screening questions that should be asked to everyone, no matter what their insurance status is. Um, exposures don't always just come from um, 
the home, if you're in an older home, it can come from um, occupational exposure. If someone works in like battery manufacturing or they work with um, fishing lures, making fishing lures, that's something that we've had um, a child exposed from like grandpa made homemade lures. So that, that metal that led to make the sinkers. Um, there's a lot of things there's a lot of different exposures. It does take, but the, the, sorry, I'm kind of stumbling, but the most one in this area though is the older homes, um, just because we have a high prevalence of those in this area. Um, so kind of back on the testing, um, finger prick or venous testing. Like I said, most times they'll do the finger prick first, but if we do get a level that comes and needs to be followed up on, we, um, we were wanting to do a venous test. So it's a little bit harder on the kiddos, but it's a lot more accurate and you're gonna get a more accurate level. Um, when the kiddos go for their annual checkup with their pediatrician, just ask questions, ask if you've got any concerns, if you're feeling like the child needs to be tested, um, always speak up. And so if you don't have Medicaid, if your child's not on Medicaid, um, those are those testing is going to come from the screening questions. Um, that's the only way to know what their levels are is if they're tested. Um, and when we talked about the follow-up testing, if that initial one is above that 3.5, that's whenever um, we're going to want them to have follow-up testing needed. Um, and just like I said earlier, the younger kiddos under six are the ones that have that more hand-to-mouth activity, and that's the need um, for testing for them. Um, any questions for me? Let me know. Thank you. I think we're good for right now, but I guess I do want to um, go back to that point about testing. Um, so, so parents can just ask their pediatrician or their family doctor to do the lead tests and it's recommended every 12 and 24 months. Yeah, those are the ages okay. that it's required by the state um, if the child's on Medicaid to be tested. And those are that's just good around across the board for every child because those are those ages that they're they're putting everything in their mouth. Um, but screening wise, when they just go to their annual checkup, that is that's an important time to talk about it. And of course, if there's any concerns. Um, and I will add, this just kind of touched the surface on lead, um, but we are doing a training uh, with the EPA next month um, that will um, help us put together like a community-wide education um, about lead poisoning prevention that anyone can attend. And so once I get all of that together, I'll share the information with you um, to, to put up with this group. So yeah. So there's more, this just kind of touched the surface, but there's more for it. Okay. Yeah. We'll definitely be sure to share that. Yeah. And uh, Laura, we did get another question in that might be out of your scope, but let's just see. Um, what obligations do landlords have to address lead issues in their properties? Versus yeah, that's ten. Do you know? That's a good one. Um, so we also, with um, the health department, have a lead risk assessor for the county, um, and they are more on the environmental side of things. So if a child, say, um, is renting, which is a lot of the homes in our area, um, when a, someone rents, they should have in their um, contract that, especially if it's an older home built before, you know, 78, um, or, you know, especially the ones in the 50s and 60s, because that was when really that paint was used a lot. Um, there should be something in the contract stating this home possibly has lead in the paint. Um, and a lot of times there will be something so that um, so the tenants are aware of that. So in regards to repairing, there's a whole um, other piece of that. You want lead abatement where they're getting rid of getting rid of the lead paint um, is a process and they need to be certified. It can't just be, um, so say for example, there's a house that someone's renting, they find out the kiddo has lead poisoning, then they get a hold with the um, owner of the home and they wanna clean it up and get rid of all the lead paint. They can't just go in there and start scraping the old paint and um, cleaning it up because that is not, um, there's a process and they can get certified like through the EPA. There's all kinds of trainings 
um, that uh, contractors can get to okay. properly get rid of lead paint. So regarding the um, the owner of the home and the tenant, that can be kind of a sticky situation. Um, yeah. And so that's when we get the lead risk assessor involved because it also um, depends on the child's level. If, so, you know, if it's just, mm -hmm. it, so is the owner obligated to do something about it? If it's a certain level, if it's okay. not, uh -huh, if, um, you know, the lower levels, those things can be mitigated with cleaning, good hand washing. Okay. Um, and as the child gets over older, their exposures are going to go down. Um, but if it's high enough that the child's having health issues right then, and um, there are certain levels that the state requires um, things, and then that's a, that's legal stuff and that's out of my scope. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but when in doubt, or if there is uh, an elevated case, you need to get the lead risk assessor involved. Yeah. And they can come out, um, and just do a walk through the home. So say if a child's level is like nine or 10, which is still elevated, but it can be, it can get way higher than that, but they can go okay. through and do a walk through of the home, um, and say, you know, it looks like here, this paint's chipping, let's, let's move things around where this kiddo's not getting access to this. Or if a lot of times it's an old porch um, and the, and they're walking, they come on the old porch and then they walk in the home. Well, leave your shoes outside. Like don't track that stuff in the house. Like those are all things that you can do to, to decrease that risk. Um, if they also have an analyzer, it's like an analyzer gun. It's a ray that they can, use to look at the paint and it'll tell what the level is um, and those need to be levels I believe it's two of them over 15 um, like verified before they'll come out and use that because once they do that then that opens up um, legal ramifications like it has to be taken care of okay yeah and so that's when we get the lead risk assessor involved that is super helpful thank yeah. you you're welcome um, and another question we have is whether or not we're seeing an increase in lead levels across the state, or at least Green County. Like, are, are there still, uh, I guess, you know, actually Sabine can probably speak to how lead continues to enter our environment. But for now, are we seeing an increase in lead levels across the state or um, do you have any I data think on that? Summertime. Um, it seems like just talking with um, the nurse that did this in the past and the staff that it was blood risk assessors in the past summertime seems to increase because everybody's outside more and playing in the dirt and coming in and out of, you know, that seems to be the increase and then it kind of goes down. But no, not that I know of. I don't have um, okay. that on the increase to the state. Okay. Well, thank you so, so much. Please thank stick you. around because we're going to have more questions at the sure. end. Um, but we can go ahead and get started with Sabine, if you are ready. And Laura, if you'll, yeah, stop sharing. Perfect. Unmute myself. <clears throat> I'm going to leave my video off if that's all right, just for bandwidth reasons. Sure. Um, so let me see. Let me share my screen. Okay. All right. It looks good. All right. Now well, let's see if this works. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about gardening safely in soils with, with lead and heavy metals, and I'm mostly concentrating on the lead here. So let's see if I can advance this. Oops. Uh-oh. And here we go. What, what's, uh, can I just ask what, and I'm experimenting with two screens here. So just All good. <laughs> bear All with good. me for a minute. What do you see right now? Do you see the title? Yes, um, we're still on the title screen. Just the title. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how about now? Uh, still just the title. Oh, no. You got it advancing earlier, so I know we can do it. Yeah, I know. So that's what makes me, oh, maybe I, hang on a second. Let me, let me stop sharing. Okay. And see what happens. Because that's kind of weird. Oh, no. 
Oh, no, it doesn't react at all anymore. What on earth? Ooh. I can't even. We're good. Te technology works for us when it, when it wants to work for us. Right? I mean, it's <laughs> just, golly, I should not have experimented with this. Hang on a second. No problem. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'm, I, I stopped sharing. <clears throat> Yes. Okay, so you don't see anything anymore. And I'm thinking I just shared maybe the wrong screen. But it should have been here. So let's try this again. So I'm going to share. Okay, we see it. You see that. And I see your cursor. You see my cursor here? Yep. Mm. On the title screen. Let me see. I think I'm staring the sharing the, the wrong thing. Hang on. Ay, ay, ay. And if you can't figure it out, I have the presentation also. Oh, so I can, I'm, I'm just going to. Let me see what happens here. OK, you still see the, the first one? Yes. How about now? Uh, yes, the, the title slide. Oh, still the title slide? Okay, so let me do this totally different. Oh. I have no idea what I'm doing wrong here or what why it doesn't work. Anything different? Uh, no, still the title screen, and I can see oh. your cursor going over it. Oh my God. Hmm. Okay, how about now? No, I'm sorry. I am so sorry about this. Oh, well, we sorry. have a lot of time, right? So I'm kind of... <laughs> <laughs> At least there's sure, sure. Let me stop. Everyone sharing. can take a take a drink of water. Stretch, yeah, exactly. Stretch Just relax a little bit. I'll mm -hmm. figure it out here. Yeah. Oh, this is on two now. I'm gonna share. Yeah. But I want to share this one. So I'm sharing this one. I just don't know why I cannot advance. That's my. Is it advancing on your screen? It's advancing on my one screen. It, it's not on the, it's not advancing on this screen. Hang on a second, let me, okay. I share screen two, what happens now? Anything? I, I see it, I see it in the PowerPoint uh, view. Oh, okay, so you're seeing this one now. Okay, yes. so let's just use this one and be done with it. So I'm just gonna go, Probably, yeah, from the Hang beginning. I mean, I'm going to the stupid bar here. Slideshow from beginning. Just, <clears throat> I just don't, and so I use, if I advance it, do you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I just, and we can see you your see notes the in the sidebar. Yeah, yeah, that's it, what it's I not figured. Full screen, but I don't, I don't think that's, that's the worst thing. Let me see, because normally when you put it on slideshow and you go from mm -hmm. beginning, mm -hmm. it should do that. Ah, uh, well, I mean, is that all right if I do it like that? I'm not sure why. I think is that's that. just fine. It just doesn't react for me right now. That's all right. Well, well, we'll figure it out the way. All right, let's just do it like this, and hopefully it works and everybody has large enough screens. Okay, so I'm gonna just set the stage a little bit here. Um, food deserts, I mean, they're very prevalent throughout the, the United States, as you can see here on the image that is on the, on the right to your screen, all the little green areas are low income census tract where a significant number or share of residents is more than one mile away from the nearest supermarket in urban areas or for rural areas, this was set as as 10 miles. So these images were last updated 
as you can see here in 2023. And I also put the, the URL here where, where you can get these images. Specifically for Missouri, this is this part here. You also can see a lot of green. What always is amazing or was amazing to me that these green areas tend also to be a lot in rural areas. And that's due to the fact, you know, 10 miles away, if you think little, small rural town, where is the next grocery store? Because usually they don't have one really in town. They need to travel to get their milk and whatever. And convenience stores do not count as full service grocery stores. So that is one issue that a lot of people, especially low income people live in in areas where there is low access to healthy foods. Um, at the same time, what we've seen through the, through the years here is a, um, an increase in small scale food production trends. So the image here shows you the national account of farmers market from a directory listing. This um, is old data. Unfortunately, these bar graphs are not produced anymore by USDA. So you can see this was last updated in August of 2014. But the quote here, that's a recent one. And, um, and you can see that reflected here in, in the data, what they're saying here. So there were approximately 7,200 farmers markets operating throughout the US as of mid 2011. And now there are more than 9,912 9, farmers markets nationwide. So there is an increase, they say 18%, and that's about right here. So this stops at 2014, but obviously it inches up. So farmers markets, people want to have locally grown food, fresh food, access to fresh food. And then the third item in this equation is the brownfields. And brownfields are um, dilapidated, often dilapidated, blighted, vacant, underutilized sites. So what I'm showing you here are some brownfields examples. This year, I think that was Flagstaff, Arizona. There used to be a service station here in the middle of town now, I mean, everything was ripped out and you can see the dirt. Um, this here is a site in Kansas City. This is a former school that has been vacant for many, many years. And right in front of it, there used to be way back when a thermometer factory. So a local gardening organization took that space over and established, thankfully, <laughs> raised beds to garden in. And they were interested in, in expanding that site. And that's where we got involved through K-State Agronomy with this grant that we used to have to test the soil for them to make sure the, the levels were OK to do so, to do the gardening. These are residential sites where people always think, well, what could be there, right? It's a residential site. There was a house. They took it down. Everything is cool. But So we'll talk about that a little bit later. And then you have a lot of times beauties like this. And when people say brownfields, that's usually what they have in mind. So you can see all this trash here. I mean, God knows what, what's lurking behind here, right next to a residential area. And just by looking at it, you just don't know for a brownfield site, for a vacant site, what used to be there and what did they do there? Did that have any impact on the soil, on the water, on the air, and on everything that, that might be growing there? So here is the official definition of a brownfield. So it's real property of which the expansion, redevelopment, or reuse may be complicated by the presence or potential presence of a hazardous substance, pollutant, or contaminant. So obviously, again, here, that is a brownfield site, right? It's underutilized. You don't know what was there before. And unless you test the soil and the groundwater or what else, you don't know what what is there? I mean, just by looking at it, you cannot tell. So we have all these brownfield sites and a lot of communities now thankfully are at least looking at making these sites into gardens. A, to, um, to beautify the community, right? I mean, who wants to look at a blighted site? A garden is so much better to look at. And B, to provide local locally produced food because there is demand. Um, if a site is classified as a brownfield site, obviously there is some funding available. If you are a not-for-profit, if you are a city, not for a proper, private property owner to get sites tested. And I get into that a little bit later. But these are some sites that I took pictures of throughout the, the country. I mean, some still do 
you know, a little bit of raised bed, they input their soils here too, that used to, that was Seattle. And then this one was a cool site because they just established raised beds on a former tennis court that was not used anymore. So there are all these different variations of what you can do. So it's, I'm assuming most of you are gardeners or you know, producers and sometimes you probably know all this already. So this slide just talks a little bit about the benefits of brownfields, what can they do for food production? What, what benefits are there in converting these sites to a productive use, reuse? So obviously visual, blight mitigation, improvement of the community image, that's a big one for communities where these sites tend to be in the center of town. Just imagine a smaller rural community, Main Street, and all of a sudden you have these gaping holes there because buildings came down and you know trash accumulates and people don't take care of it. So putting a garden there, growing food there would be a really, really a good thing. Socially, of course, creating community gathering places, a lot of times preservation of neighborhood. The environmental factor comes in. If there is something there, like say you have an elevated lead concentration in the soil or there are other contaminants, contaminants potentially associated with the soil. If you take care of it, to grow on it, obviously you're doing a good thing for the environment. And then we have this whole public health issue, so to speak, addresses, you know, when, when you convert these sites and um, address and mitigate public health and safety concerns, that includes, obviously it meshes with the environmental because you, you address the contamination. A lot of times these brownfield sites, especially in urban environments, attract often criminal activity. Like I was involved in one in Kansas City and before they put the garden in, it was in a residential neighborhood. The residents were complaining about people gathering there at night, doing God knows what. The assumption was that they were doing drugs. And so that's, that's not really a good thing. So that's when I'm also what I'm talking about, safety concerns. Health benefits, gardening is good for you. I mean, you probably all know that when you garden, physical, mental health issues, stress release, that's why I garden most of the time. Um, nutrition, access to fresh, locally grown and healthy food, and then economic benefits can be associated with that. If you, for example, establish a CSA or if you just grow for your own consumption. So a lot of benefits associated with gardening and even more benefits associated with gardening on the brownfield side. So let's talk about contaminants in urban soils. So that is one of the major challenges when, when people want to grow on a site. Um, well, I should say it can be a major challenge because we have encountered people who basically just don't care. <laughs> I mean, their argument was we have gardened here in this area in, in our backyard for ages. We are healthy, nothing happened. Why should we now all of a sudden have our soils analyzed? And yeah, I mean, that's understandable, but also as a scientist, I would also say, you know, facts kind of rule. So <laughs> um, you, you can get both, both sides of the coin here. Some people are overly concerned and some people are not concerned at all. But so this is like a list on residential lots. When I said earlier, you know, people don't suspect anything bad on residential lots. I mean, you can still have lead from lead based paint you know when they when they repainted their homes when they when the structure was taken down leaded gasoline that's that's a big one we still see that in the soil especially if lots are located on the, along the street um like about 10 feet in you can see still a lot of times an increase in lead concentration in the soil just adjacent to, to the road. We can see arsenic, uh, DDT and DDE, chlordane from pesticide application, which was done around residences frequently in former times. Uh, PAHs, you know, from incomplete burning of carbon containing materials, things like wood stoves, coal stoves, metals from the ashes, and, and so on and so forth. And then of course you have oftentimes brownfield sites that are or were former manufacturing and commercial facilities. So you can have solvents, metals, or organic me um, chemicals that, that are very, very hard to degrade. So I put this, this picture in there 
of an old gas station. And you still see those quite a bit. You know, the cold beer sign is still up. Dispensers are still there. Um, they probably didn't remove the tanks. And I mean, there could be, con I mean, there is usually contamination associated with gas stations because they also serviced cars and they had the, the used oil. The used oil contains metals. So hence the, the contamination potential for these. But really lead is the most common contaminant in the urban environment. Basically what Laura said, the lead-based paint, I added leaded gasoline, waste oil. Lead is a probable human carcinogen. And then the health effects in, in children and adults alike that Laura already talked about mostly in children because their immune system is just not, not fully um, ripened, so to speak, so, and, and seniors too. I mean, that's the same thing. Our immune system when we get older is not able to, to keep up with a lot of stuff anymore. So lead levels of two to 300 milligrams per kilogram are very, very common in urban soils. So don't think you need to have zero to be, be okay. And we'll go over later what, what lead levels are safe to, to grow on and then consume the produce. So I put here in the notes that here until the mid 1980s, and I think you can see that most gasoline used in the US was unleaded as of the mid 1980s. But again, we still see that leaded gasoline for passengers car, passenger cars was fully banned in 1996. And then what was surprising to me that aircraft and off-road vehicles are still allowed to use leaded gasoline. And then lead-based paint was based, banned for residential use in 19. 78, so just some tidbits. So I'm gonna show you some, some results from a research project that I was involved in a few years ago. This was an EPA grant that we had here with K-State Agronomy. And basically we had some test sites across the United States, seven in total. And you can see like here, this was Washington State, California. We had one in Kansas City, uh, Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania. And basically what we did is we worked with local gardening organizations that were gardening already or wanted to garden on a brownfield site. And we grew, tested the soils obviously, and we grew whatever they wanted to grow there too. And then we tested the uptake of the lead, sometimes the arsenic, whatever was prevalent in the soil into the produce that was grown there. Another thing we did, we established the site history to know what was on that site before, like 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago. And as I said, we collected soil samples and tested it. And then we came out with best management practices for the residents to be able to garden on that site safely. We continuously monitored throughout the life of the grant, the soils, and we sampled the produce. And then there was also a lot of training and technical assistance involved to the participating organizations throughout the life of the grant. So that was our process. One big thing that came out of this is that, in this instance, lead was not and is not distributed evenly in the soil. So don't assume if you take one soil sample at one location that that lead concentration is the same all across. So if you look at this uh, image here, the darker colors designate higher lead concentrations. And just FYI, the road street was down here. There were residences on each side. This is like the lot, um, the lot lines are like here. There used to be a school here. Somebody had a garage here way back when, like one of these detached garages. Um, so you can see like the lead levels went up to 305 milligrams per kilogram and were not distributed evenly at all. This is another site. This was a residential site. Um, lead concentrations here elevated what is in light blue here in milligrams per kilogram lead are the, um, the concentrations that are higher than 400 milligrams per kilogram. And 400 milligrams per kilogram is the EPA cutoff for lead in the soil for children play areas. So and you can see also it's, it's not distributed evenly. There is the adjacent residence here. There is a road here. There is a little alleyway here. 
So again, it's the distribution of lead in soil is not evenly throughout a property. The other thing, and this is probably a no-brainer, you can get contaminant dilution through basically compost addition if the compost is clean. So that's what this slide shows here. The average prior to compost addition, clean compost addition, and we tested that, was 246 milligrams per kilogram. And after compost addition, it was 146. So if you obviously eat, add a clean material to something that is impacted by contamination, yes, I mean, you can, you can dilute it. The total concentration, the lead in the soil, metals will never go away. I mean, that's another thing that probably most of you know already. So now the, the uptake into food crops. What if I have lead in the soil and I plant something on it? What does that do to, to the food crops? What is being transferred? So these are very involved um, little images. So I'm not going to go over everything. So this image here shows the lead concentration in Swiss chard. Um, compost. It added to the soil, no, no compost added to the soil. You can see that we use two different cleaning methods. Lab cleaning means we rinsed the Swiss chard with distilled water and surfactants, basically like, like some dish soap, stuff like that, just to really get everything off. And then the blue bar designates kitchen clean, which is what we would do in our kitchens, right? We clean the produce under running tap water. And you can see the difference. I mean, kitchen cleaning still has more lead concentrations in, in, the, in the Swiss chart than the lab cleaned one. So the lead concentration is in milligrams per kilogram. What's up here is the, um, the MCL, the maximum contaminant level for Swiss chart that was set by for international trade purposes, right? Because we don't have any type of, of concentration levels like for example, we have MCLs for soils, we have it for, for water, we have it for air, that's set by the state environmental um, agencies and by the EPA. But for, um, for produce, for food products, we only have it for international trade. So you can see that the lead levels here that we found in the Swiss chart are way below this MCL here. If it would be above, obviously that would be a concern. You can also see that compost addition reduced the lead concentrations in the soil by about 59% here. And then that's the percentage here for, for the lab cleaning, the reduction of the lead on the lead in uh, on the Swiss chart. Soil levels, lead levels without compost addition were up to 348 milligrams per kilogram. So for tomatoes, pretty much the same thing. I mean, compost addition really helped with, uh, with the lead concentrations in the produce, not quite as much as here with a, with a Swiss chard. All below the, the codex here, the MCL, the maximum contaminant level. So um, soil lead was maximum 271 milligrams per kilogram and the cleaning methods, the more you clean, the more you get off, right? And that's not to say that you should now stand in your kitchens and, you know, use detergent to, to clean your tomatoes or your produce, but just know that the, the better you clean it off, the better off you are, because especially on greens, on leafy crops, you get a lot of splash because they're uh, closer to the ground, so soil particles can get onto that much more easier than on like say tomatoes that might grow like a foot up from the ground. So carrots so, here, this is a little bit different, right? You can also see a, we have three colors now because we lab cleaned, we kitchen cleaned and we peeled the carrots. The difference was not remarkable. And you can also see this is the MCL. All of a sudden we are very close or above the MCL. And that's due to the fact that the carrot takes up moisture, nutrients, whatever is in the soil through the center of the carrot, through the xylem, and not from the outside in. It's a root crop. So that's, that's the difference here. So 
planting carrots, and again, 388 maximum soil lead levels here in the, in the soil, pretty much comparable to what we had for, for the tomatoes and the Swiss chard. I mean, the carrots are much more affected by that. Sabine, a quick yeah. question. Well, maybe a quick sort of uh, summary, just to put all of this in context for the attendees. Mm -hmm. So what it sounds like is that different crops grown in the soil are more or less susceptible to absorbing lead is, is you know. That, that is correct. Yes. And I have a slide charged. later on that tells you a little oh. bit more about that. Yeah. Yes, okay. We'll get to that. Okay. But, but also then, I guess... What should the attendees take away from the vegetables that are not near the codex? You know, they're they're not reaching that very elevated right. maximum level, but also we know that any amount of lead is unsafe. So well, we'll get to that later too, but I'm gonna say okay. what I will say at this point already is uh -huh. that whatever whatever is in the produce does not necessarily, is going to, not going to be absorbed in your body. So a lot of that passes okay. through, okay? So okay. I mean, that's, and whatever is in the soil, that also doesn't mean that that is what you, what your body will absorb. Okay. Yeah. It sounds like you've got that covered. So I'll let you get back yeah, to it. Yeah, exactly. So that's, that's <laughs> hopefully you. all going to become a little <laughs> clearer. Thank you. Thank you. Go yes, ahead. I just wanted to show you this because the, these graphs kind of, you know, it, it kind of runs at home a little bit better. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about, bio, and that kind of goes on the same theme, right? Bioaccessibility. So what amount of or what concentrations are actually accessible to an org organism, a human or a plant for absorption? And that depends, the amount of bioaccessibility of soil contaminants depends obviously on the contaminant per se, and then the soil properties. So soil properties meaning like sandy versus clay soil. This was a, an experiment that was done in Australia where they um, put different they spiked the, the soil here with zinc. So zinc is a micronutrient, plants need it, humans need it. But again, it's like the quantity that counts, right? Same with chocolate. You don't wanna to eat too much, but if you eat in moderation, it's all good. So what you can here see is this is a control when no zinc was added. And here on the other side of, on the right-hand side here, 300 milligrams per kilogram zinc were added. So. I want you to look at this part here, 150 milligrams per kilogram. So for all intents and purposes, whatever is growing here, some sort of grass or whatever, that's dead. Nothing is working there, right? If we look at the picture for clay soil, here again, 150 milligrams per kilogram zinc spike. This plant is very healthy. It's not near death, right? It's like, it's actually taller than, than these here. Um, and that is due to the fact that now you're growing in, in clay soil, meaning that the clay minerals, they absorb the metals. I don't know if you remember from your chemistry, I mean, the clay surfaces are negatively charged. Most metals, thing two, are positively charged. So you have that, that bond that's gonna be created in the soil, meaning, the zinc here that is in the soil is not 100% accessible to the plant. It stays in the soil. So since Springfield, I mean, you have very clay soils. That's a good thing. I mean, as a gardener, you might curse that <laughs> because it's, sometimes it's difficult to garden in it. But if you have some lead in the soil, that's actually good. Here is another slide that I want to show you. So this was lead in plant tissue and the roots for root crops. See, we had like beets here and, and carrots. And um, we did a, a soil test called PBET, physically, physiologically based extraction test. Um, what you can see here is all lead in the soil is not available for uptake, right? So you have soil concentrations in the soil here, ranging from 1,500 to 2,100 milligrams per kilogram. Here are the lead concentrations for the different types of produce that we had here. And here, the, the open 
circles, this is the percentage of total soil lead that is absorbed by the different types of plants. So again, I mean, you're very high up here for the P-bed lead, but as a percentage, it's like down here. And you can also see very nicely that, for example, the car carrots have higher lead concentrations, right? And the, the lettuce is pretty much the lowest here along with the mustard, so the, the leafy greens. And then there is another one here that I'm going to show you. This is an older slide. Remember when Laura said now the blood lead level concentrations allowable for children are 3.5 micrograms per deciliter. Now this was still done when it was 10. So this is a couple of years old. But what I want to show here, if you look at this curve here, number one, this depicts 800 milligrams lead per kilogram of soil with a 30% bioavailability. So 30% of that 800 would be available. If you look at number two, this is 375 milligrams per kilogram in the soil, so much less, and it also has a 30% bioavailability. And then three, again, is 800 with only a 15% bioavailability. So two and three, you have much higher lead concentrations in the soil, the 800 here versus the 375. But for the 800, only 15% of that lead is actually bioavailable, and that makes all the difference. So really, the reducing the bioavailability of something, in this case lead that is in the soil, is as effective as reducing the total lead concentration, meaning that if you do the right thing with your BMPs, and we're getting to that, if you reduce the bioavailability, you can safely garden in soils that have higher lead concentrations. So, and here are, is the slide that probably is of interest to the most of you. What are the limits? What are the recommendations for lead impacted soils? At what concentrations is it safe? And what should you do? You stay away from when you get higher concentrations. So less than 50 milligrams per kilogram. And for this, obviously, you need to know what you have in the soil, right? Don't make any assumptions. Do get it tested. So less than 50 means pretty much little or no lead concentrations. You don't need to do anything special. 50 to 250 milligrams per kilogram. There is obviously some lead present, a little bit elevated. Growing veggies is okay. Even the root crops are still okay at that point. But what you want to do is limit the dust and watch your kids. As Laura said, kids, especially young kids, they stick everything in their mouth, right? My kids, my daughter, for some odd reason, she liked dirt. Whenever we were outside, she stuffed a handful of dirt in her mouth. And there are lots of other kids, I think, who do that. So you, when you take little kids with you in the garden, just watch them if you know that you have lead in the soil. Limit the dust, that goes to inhalation risks. That means if, you, if it's really dusty, make sure you, you irrigate, you water before you work in the garden. Cover your walkways, for example, and I have some a detailed list of what you can do later on here in the slide presentation so that you don't inhale dust. Like don't, don't rototill, for example, when it's hot and, and dry and you create a lot of dust. So where it gets interesting is here, 250 to 400. The recommendation is do not grow the root crops. Remember the carrot image that I showed you because root crops take up more, more, um, more metals, more, more lead, potentially more arsenic than leafy crops or, or fruit crops. Limit the dust, watch the kids. 400 to 1,200 milligrams. Same thing, this is, I, I, I would personally, I'd say this at these levels, I'd go to waste beds. Right, and greater than 1,200 milligrams per kilogram, not recommended for vegetables. You can safely grow anything else like perennials, you know, shrubs, trees, ornamentals. Um, again, taking certain precautions, wash your hands, you know, do all that good stuff. Uh, use raised beds or containers with clean soil if you do want to, want to go with vegetables. 
And this basically says the same thing. It's just a different way of depicting it. So again, like 400 milligrams per kilogram, that is the level that EPA sets for lead in soils for children's playgrounds. So just keep that in mind. Uh, I'm gonna to touch really briefly on arsenic in soils. We have it like in, in we, we grew that for a test in, um, I think the most arsenic we had in Seattle at a test site. So again, I mean, we, we have the, the soil concentrations. You can see the arsenic concentrations here. We did lettuce, tomatoes, and carrots. So I always tried for this, this research project to do a leafy crop, a fruiting crop, and a root crop. So you can see the MCLs here, and this is micrograms per kilogram, not milligrams per kilogram, right? So a lot less than the MCLs for, for lead. And again, kitchen versus, versus lab cleaned. So for the exposure pathways, the way you can expo be exposed when you garden in lead, I'm saying contaminated, like maybe impacted soil, right? Is the direct exposure when you actually ingest the soil, when you eat the soil particles. Hence with the, uh, the leafy vegetables that grow close to the ground, just make sure you really wash them off well. So you get rid of all that splash, the soil particles that attach to the soil when it either rained or when you watered watch out for the dust. So this goes to inhalation and the dermal contact. So that's the direct transfer from the soil to a human being. The indirect exposure would then be if you eat something that was grown in the soil. So it goes from the soil to the plant to the human. So in order to grow safely on mildly contaminated sites, and I mean, we're not talking super fun sites here, right? I mean, we're talking mildly contaminated site because no one in their sane mind would establish a garden on a super fun site and a grossly contaminated site that has not been cleaned up where the contaminants have not been addressed. If it's a vacant lot, you definitely wanna know what was there before because that will, drive what contaminants could potentially be in the soil. And then you want to make sure what actually is in the soil. How much is there? Does it need to be addressed? And knowing all of that, you apply your best management practices, like adding soil amendments or just going straight to raised beds, cover the walkways, you mulch to select the appropriate crops, and you kind of educate yourself as to what what things mean, what you should do or not do. So the questions to ask, if you garden on a site, if you want to garden on a site where you know nothing about, it, right? So you wanna know, is there contamination? If so, what is it? How much is there? Does it need to require cleanup? Based on those results, do you grow in the ground or above the ground? And that's also oftentimes governed by who will work in the garden. Is it going to be adults? Am I going to grow with kids? Do seniors grow in the garden where I may want to go to raise beds right away because seniors may have a problem bending over in the garden directly in the soil? What are the general soil conditions? That goes to nutrients. That goes to clay versus sandy. What do I need to do to work in this, to have the soil such that I actually will get good yields? And then what crops will be grown? So all these questions you probably want to think about before you start gardening and something like this. So for the contamination, <clears throat> I put some resources here. Uh, you want to know what was the previous use properly? Is there contamination and all this kind of stuff? So all that goes to the contamination questions. We put some, um, <clears throat> excuse me, some, some fact sheets together. If you're interested, I put the links in here. For sampling and analysis, I mean, most people, I'd say, I mean, you, you cannot sample a lot to death. You can when you're extremely rich and you have all the money in the world and you can sample every centimeter or every inch of the soil. That is not realistic, right? So what you can do is you can contact your state agency. If it's a brownfield site, they have assessment funding through EPA to provide free 
um, testing of the soil. If you are a not-for-profit, if you are a, a city um, um, government, they may have some other stipulations there. They very rarely, and I don't think at all, provide this kind of service to private citizens. The same thing here for EPA Region 7, they provide the same thing, EPA does. The way to get around that is like if you're a private property owner and you want to garden and maybe you want to not only for your own use, but you want to establish like a CSA on your on your property, organize yourself. I mean, go go talk to maybe you talk to your city and the city applies on your behalf. You know, so that's possible. Um, case your agronomy can analyze for lab for for certain uh, metals. I mean, that's like a, a pay for for the analysis type deal. You can contract with environmental laboratories. They also they might send out technicians to actually sample the soil, so you don't have to do that. And consulting environmental consulting firms do the same thing. So you have some options here as to what to do. Um, this might, I'm just gonna skip over this. This might get a little bit too, too much into the weeds. We can talk about that next September, but this is basically how do you find out, you know, what was on your site and information gathering, like where do I get historic property information, like the title search. You can farm that out. There are companies who do title searches. It's not that expensive. I'm thinking a couple hundred bucks or so, but you can also do it yourself. You know, you go to the county courthouse, county assessor recorder, and check the chain of title and see what was on that property. Is there anything that raises a red flag regarding what could be in the soil? So growing in ground, above ground, who will work in the garden? So here are some decision-making drivers. Um, a lot of times it's a liability issue. We have worked with, through in this project a few years back, we work with one city and they said, well, for liability issues, if we want to have a community garden here on the Brownfield side, we will require them to go to raised beds no matter what, because we do not want to be sued for somebody. They got something from, you know, growing in that soil. Um, a lot of times it's the comfort level of gardeners regarding residual contamination. As I said, you know, some, some people just plain don't care, like this case in Kansas City that I mentioned, and others might care. But I think, again, you need to have some data to make an informed decision. You need to know what's there. Um, the soil conditions, I mean, that's of course a decision-making driver. What do I need to do? How much money do we need to spend if I want to uh, grow in the ground to get the soil to where it needs to be. And that goes for the contaminant level, that contaminants that could potentially be there, and also for nutrients level, the workability of the soil. Think really clay soils. I mean, you need to add compost. How much is that going to cost? Versus then the cost of, of putting raised beds in. Well, it's not cheap either. And definitely if you do that, I would recommend have the soil that goes into those raised beds tested to make sure it's clean. And I mean, the space, that's also a, a consideration for a lot of people. Accessibility, again, seniors, gardening, you might want to have raised beds. When you garden in the ground, obviously, you need to have some precautions. If there is some residual contamination, if there is some lead in the soil, and you end up adding soil amendments to take care of that. So general soil conditions, we're talking urban soils, urban soils, especially if they are on a lot where that has been previously used, there may have been structures there, are usually not great. I mean, they're actually pretty crappy usually. Um, nutrient status, you need to do something that's usually inadequate. Soil pH, yeah, kind of depends where you are. Organic matter content is usually very low in urban soils, so you might want to have to remedy that. Usually there's compaction, especially if there was something on that site before when they dosed the building. You know, a lot of times in the older home areas with basements, they just kind of schlopped everything into the basement, put a, a foot off, um, off topsoil on it and called it good. So you can get like a little bit of, of um, 
different <laughs> um, levels of like elevation levels in the soil when everything is settled. And you can have really hard, hard, hard soils, very compacted soils where they drove over with their equipment. Soil chemistry, the metals, the lead, but also something from, it could be that when, when cities heavily salt and most silly cities get away from that in the winter, you can have a lot of excess salts, which might be phytotoxic, right? Um, excess sodium too. Nutrient status. It's important, obviously, and note here the phosphorus. I mean, before you add anything, have your soils tested for, for your nutrients. Your extension service can provide that for you. Um, phosphorus is important for root growth, flower production, but it also binds metals, which means, remember, reducing the bioavailability. So whatever is in the soil, as far as lead in this instance goes, or arsenic, it's bound to the organic matter, to the phosphorus, and the phosphorus helps with all of that. Here's the compaction. Organic matter binds the metals, reduces the avail availability, pH. If you have a high pH, you mobilize certain metals. So just keep that in mind. But for gardening, you want to be somewhat around seven and a half, eight. So, I mean, all of these things is as a gardener, you use probably, you do this already. You adjust your pH, you watch your nutrients, you watch and remedy compaction, you know, you add organic materials just to make sure you get a good yield and can garden. Um, so whatever you do here, binds, contaminates, reduces bioavailability. Whatever you do to, to achieve that, whatever you do to work the soil without taking any consider, in, into consideration if there's metal or not, that's already a good thing to reduce bioavailability. So here again is the dilution when you add that and usually you have to add compost if you garden in an urban environment. So for your agronomic information, again, to get that tested is important. Minimum every three years, commercial labs, extension systems. I mean, your cooperative extension system in Missouri is able to, to provide that service to you. I know rates varies for samples, but in the big scheme of things, it's cheap. Like here in Manhattan, I can get my soils tested every, every I think, two years or three years, and it, it's like $3 a sample. So I, it's, it's minuscule. So, and lastly, again, the BMP's crop selection. I mean, if you are not sure, should I, should I not? Is there, is that too much lead or is that lead level okay? Stay away from the root crops, okay? Just go with the leafy and the fruit bearing crops like strawberries, radishes, eh, sweet potatoes, not good, but Swiss chard, you know, and, and tomatoes. So here is a summary of all of this. Most of this is really is common sense, right? Because you till, as I said, you till and you compost already to mitigate your compaction. You add compost, or if you have in your area biosolids to improve soil structure and mitigate protection, uh, compaction and provide nutrients. You add, you adjust your pH to the right level to be able to grow and get decent yields. Select the suitable crop type, mulch your garden beds. You probably do that anyhow because you don't want to have all that moisture escape and you mulch your garden beds. Um, what I put here in notes is also, scroll down that, whoops, a little bit. What Laura mentioned too, when you get out of the garden, wash your hands, take off your shoes, don't drag anything into the house. You know, dust off, change your clothes after gardeners, after gardening. Especially then if you have smaller kids, wash your produce really well under running tap water. Um, if, you, if you do all that, and again, most of this is it's common sense. If you apply these best management practices and keep in mind the recommended limits for soil lead in terms of growing the vegetables, that one slide that I, I showed, then it can be a really safe experience. And a lot of it is just being comfortable with it. I mean, know what you're dealing with and act accordingly. If you are unsure, go to raise beds. Okay, I think that's, yep, that was my last slide. 
Any questions? We actually have a lot of questions I because bet. <laughs> we, we solicited some from social media ahead of time. Um, and I just, I'm putting your last quote in the chat, in the chat there. I think that's very powerful to know what you're dealing with and act accordingly. Um, that's very helpful advice. And I first want to ask a question that's probably come up the most in speaking with people. And that is whether or not it's effective to use um, things like sunflowers <laughs> or fungi to help remediate soil. We hear a lot about how you can plant this or that and it, and it removes lead or other um, harmful contaminants from the soil. So right. what do you have to say about that? The answer to is it's yes, it will remove lead, but the amount of time it takes to remove the lead. I mean, you're going to grow old before you have a site that actually has the lead removed. So, I mean, that, that's okay. that thing. Yeah, I, 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 well, next time I'll stick a slide in there. <laughs> so but, it I might mean, take it several growing seasons. Oh, at least. I mean, we're talking decades here. Oh, wow. I mean, okay. it's a long, long time. Other, the other thing, keep in mind, especially with sunflowers, you're talking about translocation, meaning they take up the lead. And then a lot of people think, okay, you know, yeah, I compost. That's a good thing. And then you, they compost the sunflowers. Now the sunflowers have lead in them. So their compost becomes contaminated uh, and impacted with lead. So that's, that's the other facet. So it keeps it. feeding it back into yeah, the soil. Yeah. So I'd be very, very cautious trying that approach. Okay. Um, and I'd also just encourage anyone still uh, listening, go ahead. If you do have unanswered questions, put them in the chat now so we can make sure to get to them. But I, I have a list that we've been keeping track <laughs> of. Um, so one question, which we definitely covered is, will lead break down in the soil or must it be removed? The answer is that it does not break down without intervention. You have to Correct. take steps to remediate it from the soil. And it doesn't break down. I mean, there is no such thing, really. I mean, it just okay. it could take a different form, potentially. But for our purposes, I mean, you take steps to make it less bioavailable. It's still okay. in the soil, but it will not go then into, into the produce, into the plants that you grow. Okay, gotcha. Um, and so we know about lead and paint, um, we shared on Springfield Community Garden social media a lot about how uh, Southeast Missouri is part of the lead belt. We mm -hmm. have lead, a history of lead mining in our area, and that has contributed to our contamination as well. But speaking of 2023, where we are today, does lead continue to be presented to us in the environment, or is it all sort of just leftover from old practices? Boy, that's a hard one. I would say, I mean, most of it should be still left over because as I said, it's it's not going to go away. As far as new contributions, I mean, we don't have lead-based paint for residential anymore. We don't have leaded gasoline unless you drive an off-road vehicle. Apparently, you can still get gasoline that's leaded for that legally okay <laughs> so you ride that across your garden um yeah i would say that i mean it's it's left over okay well that's that's promising at least yeah but i mean remember it's, it's not going away so we had a site uh i think that was out west they wanted to establish a garden under a water tower and i mean water towers get sandblasted and you know painted fairly frequently and when mm -hmm. we tested the soils, just from that, and there was, I mean, the old paint comes off with it too, right? I mean, even if they now use new paint, that doesn't mean that the old paint that's underneath it doesn't get chipped when it's blasted. So they had screaming high lead levels in the soil underneath that water tower. Okay, wow. Um, speaking of testing, going back to testing, um, because and Laura, you might want to weigh in on this also. People are interested in testing in their soil, but they're also interested in testing in their homes. Related to soil, you shared that resource um, to a laboratory, and I put something in the chat 
about MU extensions mm -hmm. lab services, and they yep. also offer a ton of different tests. Um, you can test for lead and heavy metals. There's a, a, a small setup fee, and then you do have to pay for each different test, but that is available. Mm -hmm. um, people have asked about at home tests. Are there at home testing kits that someone could buy and like, and, and yeah. I don't know if that's, it's out there for nutrients for sure. And okay. I mean, like the little, yeah, it could be out there for metals too. I don't know. I okay. would not recommend that because okay. they usually are so inaccurate. I mean, you don't get a good reading. And if you get it done through extension, what you pay is, I mean, it's not much. I don't know what, what MU extension charges, I think ours are, gosh, last time I looked, and again, that was like last year, it might've changed. I think it's like $10, $10 a sample around that kind of, you know. Yeah, it, it's different depending. There, There's yeah. usually a $25 setup fee and then different okay. tests run between $10 on up. So yeah. there, it, it, it's um, very customizable. Yeah, I mean, metals um, testing is cheap. If you get into okay. pesticides and you're talking hundreds of dollars, but like for metals, I mean, that's, yeah, definitely okay. worth it. Definitely worth it. Um, Laura, can you speak to any at home testing for, um, yeah. for so home, inside have, homes? There, um, there are definitely at home ones, but back to what Sabine says, I wouldn't recommend. Um, it's going to be a lot more accurate if you're going through um, a lab. And if like, for example, if your child's um, levels are elevated enough and the lead risk assessor needs to come out, they have the better equipment that's going to give a lot more accurate reading. But a lot of times families before, you know, the a child's level gets that elevated, they'll just order them off Amazon. And there's like dust wipes and things like that, that you can it's an at-home test kit, um, but to get a confirmed reading, no, I wouldn't recommend them either. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, regarding cleaning vegetables, well, mm -hmm. any crop uh, prior to eating, I know that your studies were uh, using surfactants, but someone's asking about like at-home cleaners, like you can go to the store and buy a natural produce wash like are there certain ingredients that you would recommend that people should look for gosh I know I mean gosh I didn't get into the weeds on that one okay. and when we did it was like yeah I mean anything if you want to go that additional step I mean just get anything that really has soapy and organic obviously is good okay like the more cleaning the better it is you know okay um, if growing flowers, mm -hmm. will the contaminants be present when touching the flowers or the, the petals? No. I mean, that, that transfer usually is, no, I, I think that's totally negligible. Okay. No. Well, that's good news. We have a lot of yep. flower farmers on staff <laughs> and who we work with. Um, and then you mentioned root crops being mm -hmm. more risky. So it's like there's, there's, there are contaminants that, you know, are on the outside of the crop, but then as well as growing in and yeah. root crops for obvious reasons, they're taking in so much of the water uh, and, and living down beneath the soil. So that does make sense. Um, someone asked, do I have to use a raised bed? Well, nope. that again, depends on the risk you're well, it, it depends on your site and the amount of risk you're comfortable taking. But to be safe, I mean, if someone does have young children at home and, and they're concerned about it, um, a raised bed does provide more protection, correct? Yes. I mean, if, if you have clean soil in that raised bed, so do get that tested too. Okay. I mean, don't just rely, if you go to like a big box store and you buy topsoil, I mean, if you want to be totally on the safe side, you know, get that tested. If you buy a lot of times when you get compost, I know some like commercially, you know, even some cities, they test their compost. So I mm. mean, that's always worth a question to ask if that is tested and if you can see the analyses. I, you know, I bet someone on our staff knows whether or not the city tests our compost. I'm, I'm not sure. So I'll have to follow up with that. 
some cities do and some don't. That's very good to know, because I know a lot of our gardeners in our network get city compost. Um, I, I, I guess one closing thought, it, it sounds like using the regenerative practices you mentioned are better for working in soils that are somewhat contaminated. Like you said, less tilling or tilling, not when it's super, super dry. Mm -hmm. um, adding compost and soil amendments to dilute the contaminants and make it less bioavailable, mm -hmm. all of that. And, and that's something that Springfield Community Gardens does promote and tries to help yeah. teach with our growers in Springfield. So that makes me feel a little bit better. And that's some, you know, another reason we can use to continue promoting that kind of uh, agriculture in our area. I think those are all of our questions. Is are there any other parting thoughts or or questions you think should have been asked? On my side, no. I think that that pretty much covers. I mean, if there's something if something pops up later, you can always send me an email, you know, or or call me. Email is probably best. But really, I think that the point that I would like to drive home today: if you garden somewhere, just get your soil tested. Period. You know, just just know what you're dealing with and then you can make decisions as because I know a lot of your gardeners probably sell produce too. So mm -hmm. that might also play into the, the equation a little bit. And yeah, I mean just just know and then just yeah, common sense, you know, what what you most of the times what you do anyhow to to garden to get a good crop also addresses metals in the soil. Perfect. And Laura, anything from you? I know you said you would uh, follow up with that additional EPA training when it was available. Um, and did you also mention I could share your contact information in case people had questions? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You can share it and then I will get you more information um, with that training down the road. Um, okay. And just ever in doubt, just call and ask questions and then testing through um, your pediatrician is going to be the best, best bet for sure. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, as a reminder, I did put a link to today's evaluation into the chat and you should be prompted after we exit to also fill out that evaluation, but it helps us in our reporting to make sure that we're offering uh, good workshops and resources for you for the future. So thank you again for joining us. And thank you, Sabine and Laura. That was excellent. And uh, stay tuned for the follow-up webinar that we'll have in a few weeks. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye.